While the 27 Club doesn't have formal membership, it's widely recognized as one of rock and roll's most identifiable groups of musicians. Yet it's the least desirable club anyone would want to be a member of. Today we're going to talk about the members of the 27 Club and the tragic stories of their demise. But before we get started, take a second to subscribe to the Weird History Channel and let us know what music stories you would like to hear more about. Now let's take a look at those great musicians who left too early. While every musician's death in the 27 Club is tragic, the Minutemen's D. Boone story has an extra layer of sadness because it was caused by chance, a tragic automobile accident. On December 22nd, nine days after finishing a tour opening for R.E.M., Boone, his fiancée Linda Kite, and her sister Janine were traveling down an isolated stretch of Interstate 10 in Arizona en route to New Mexico for a short vacation. While Linda was behind the wheel of their 1979 Dodge van, Boone and her sister were sleeping in the rear cargo area, neither wearing seatbelts. It was later revealed that Boone was dealing with a severe fever. Unexpectedly, the van's rear axle snapped and the vehicle was sent flying into a ditch, a common roadside hazard in the Arizona desert. They were approximately 50 miles east of the city of Quartzsite. Boone was thrown from the van's open rear doors, dying instantly from a broken neck. Boone's bandmates, Mike Watt and George Hurley, would later form Firehose, with Watt eventually going on to carve out a successful solo career for himself. Since the first Firehose album, Watt has dedicated every record he has worked on, be it Firehose, solo or otherwise, to Boone's memory. There was no mystery in the death of Amy Winehouse. In the months leading up to July 23rd, Winehouse would appear on stage visibly intoxicated with slurred speech as she fumbled around the stage. At her final concert on June 18th in Belgrade, which was also the kickoff of her European tour, fans were even heard booing her due to her state of inebriation. The tour was canceled and it was assumed that she was going to get help for her evident substance abuse. But from that point, Winehouse spent most of her time at her London flat in Camden. Her bodyguard, who spent the last three days with her, later said she was still drinking heavily. He also said he observed her laughing, listening to music, and watching TV at 2 a.m. the day of her death. So he wasn't alarmed when she was still in bed that afternoon. When the bodyguard tried to wake Winehouse up at 3 p.m., he realized she wasn't breathing and had no pulse. At 3.54 p.m., ambulances were dispatched, but she was pronounced dead at the scene. A coroner's inquest reached a verdict of misadventure, while alcohol played a major role in Winehouse's death, her brother stated that her battle with bulimia factored heavily into her passing. In a late June 2013 interview, Alex Winehouse said, She suffered from bulimia very badly. I think that it left her weaker and more susceptible. Had she not had an eating disorder, she would have been physically stronger. If you ask Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, their former Rolling Stones bandmate, Brian Jones' spirit died long before he passed away on his East Sussex estate in 1969. Addiction ravaged Jones to the point he was often in a near comatose state. You can see how bad things got for him in the Stones' The Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus. At certain points in the performance, Jones is seen shaking a pair of maracas in a daze, unsure of where he is or what he's doing there. Approximately seven months after Rock and Roll Circus, Jones was found at the bottom of a swimming pool in Cotchford Farm, his country estate which was once owned by Winnie the Pooh author A. A. Milne. While the coroner's report stated, death by misadventure, Jones's autopsy doctor states that the cause of Jones's death was accidental drowning. But there's a theory that Jones was murdered by Frank Thorogood, a handyman who was doing construction work on the estate. Thorogood, who was with Jones that night, is alleged to have killed the musician over money. He had been paid 18,000 pounds for work on Cotchford Park, but he was demanding another 6,000. Robert Johnson may not have the name recognition of guitar gods like Hendrix or Eric Clapton, but it's easy to argue that none of those modern rock gods would have had a career if it weren't for him. Johnson was an American blues singer, songwriter, and musician. Musician historians recognize him as one of the founders of the blues, particularly the Delta Blues. Legend has it that Johnson sold his soul to the devil at a local crossroads to achieve musical success. But that's a weird history story for another time. Like many musicians in the 27 Club, Johnson's death is also a mystery. 
While we know that he died near Greenwood, Mississippi, no formal autopsy was done, as dead black man found on a plantation in 1938 raised few eyebrows with the law at the time. That said, there was a handwritten note on the back of the certificate that stated the cause of death was complications of syphilis. Of course, the popular myth states that Johnson was poisoned. David Honeyboy Edwards, another Delta Blues guitarist and singer, and the guitarist's friend, claimed that Johnson had been poisoned and that he was probably targeted by a jealous husband of one of his mistresses. Nine months after the deaths of Hendrix and Joplin, Jim Morrison was found by his longtime girlfriend, Pamela Corson. She found him sitting upright in a bathtub filled with water. And yes, like Hendrix and Joplin, mystery surrounded Morrison's death. After recording L.A. Woman with The Doors in Los Angeles, a bearded and paunchy Morrison decided he wanted to get away from it all, fame, work, and the pressure of the record industry. He retreated to Paris with Corson in March of 1971, and by all accounts, he got his life back in order. Within weeks, Morrison lost the weight, shaved his beard, and started taking long walks around Paris. Unfortunately, many of his French acquaintances say he never fully gave up drugs. During the early hours of July 3, 1971, Corson alleges that she found Morrison dead in their apartment's bathtub, and yes, this is where it gets weird. Because French law doesn't require autopsies, Morrison's death has never been thoroughly investigated. His official cause of death was listed as heart failure, but there are several statements from people like Marianne Faithful and his friend Sam Burnett that insist it was a heroin overdose. Like Morrison, the death of Janis Joplin is also mysterious, with foggy accounts from various sources. But one of the unexplainable details of Joplin's death is its timeline. We know she died of a drug overdose, but when? And was anyone with her? On a late Sunday afternoon, Joplin was booked at Sunset Sound, a world-renowned recording studio a few miles away from the landmark hotel she was staying at during the recording of Pearl. When she was late for the session, producer Paul Rothschild called John Cook, Joplin's close friend who was staying at the landmark. Immediately after Rothschild's request, Cook entered Joplin's room and found her lifeless body on the floor beside her bed. And here's where it gets interesting. While alcohol was found in Joplin's room, no doubt Southern Comfort, her drink of choice, there was no evidence of narcotics. It was removed from the scene by an unidentified friend. When the friend found out an autopsy was going to reveal that narcotics were in Joplin's system, the drug paraphernalia mysteriously reappeared in her room. Joplin's publicist Mira Friedman also alleges that the singer chatted with the hotel lobby clerk, asked him to break a $5 bill to buy cigarettes from a nearby vending machine after she already had the fatal dose of drugs in her system. If Morrison or Joplin's death is shrouded in mystery, Kurt Cobain's cause of death is more complicated than the Da Vinci Code. If you ask your friends how Cobain died, it's a good bet that half of them will say it was suicide, with the other half claiming he was murdered. Here's what we know. On April 8, 1994, the Cobains had an electrician, Gary T. Smith, scheduled to install exterior security lighting around their Seattle, Washington home as a deterrent for trespassing Nirvana fans. Not long after he arrived, Smith saw Cobain from a distance, laying in the greenhouse located above the couple's detached garage. When he noticed blood oozing from Cobain's ear, Smith called the Seattle Police Department. It didn't take long for investigators to determine Cobain committed suicide. Besides finding Cobain gripping the barrel of a shotgun, investigators found a suicide note and puncture wounds on the inside of both elbows. Coroners determined Cobain had died three days before his body was found. Of course, alternative theories on Cobain's death will continue until the end of time and all revolve around his wife, Courtney Love. According to his attorney, Rosemary Carroll, Cobain asked her to drop a will excluding Love because he was planning to file for divorce. Your conclusions may vary. There's a lot of controversy surrounding the death of Jimi Hendrix, but here are the confirmed facts. After several days of poor sleep, stress from a managerial contract he was trying to break, and the realization that Billy Cox, his bassist in the Jimi Hendrix experience, was leaving his band, Hendrix went to a small gathering at his friend Pete Cameron's London flat at 2 a.m. Witnesses say Hendrix was only at the party for an hour before his girlfriend, Monica Daneman, caused the scene and forced him to leave, returning to her Notting Hill apartment. 
Once back at her place, Hendricks struggled to fall asleep, having taken at least one amphetamine pill at Cameron's party hours earlier. Finding Hendricks sleeping the following morning between 10 a.m. and 10.20 a.m., Danneman left her apartment to buy cigarettes. When she returned at 11 a.m., she found the guitarist unconscious, but breathing. She called for an ambulance that arrived at 11.27 a.m., but by then, Hendricks was covered in his own vomit and unresponsive. Autopsists later reported that Hendricks had partially digested food in his stomach and throat, a collapsed lung, and a moderate amount of amphetamine, cannabis, and alcohol in his bloodstream. Vesperax was also found in Hendricks' system, the barbiturate that Danneman initially denied him, but later admitted she gave him nine pills, 18 times the recommended dosage. His post-mortem examination concluded that Hendricks choked on his own vomit and died of asphyxia while intoxicated with barbiturates. While the claim of the statistical spike in deaths of 27-year-old musicians are consistently disproven by research, the 27 Club remains a cultural phenomenon. One thing is certain, though, the deaths of the club's members all have a common thread of sadness and regret. In many cases, fate played a lead role in their passing. What other musicians do you think deserve a name check? What made their passing so mystifying? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other music stories from our weird history.